Hello everyone and welcome back to Teach Astronomy. Oh, I think I'm a little loud today. I'll turn that down just a bit. I hope everyone's doing well this Monday morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Um, today, oh, my name is Victoria, but you can call me Vicky. I almost forgot to introduce myself. Um, but today, uh, since it's Monday, we are going to be doing another chapter of Dreams of Other Worlds. And uh, we are on a little bit of a time crunch today because I have somewhere to be at noon. Um, and so we are going to just uh, just jump right on into it. So um, ASMK, hello, welcome. Hope, uh, hope you guys are going to enjoy this. Hi, Lynn Jersey. All right, let's, uh, let's start it up. So this chapter is uh, about Hipparchos, mapping the Milky Way. A 1939 biography of Albert Einstein offers a... Oh, wait. My microphone is not set to the right thing. Hold on. Sorry if that was loud. I think now... I think now it'll sound better. Maybe. I don't know. At least you won't get any street noise, I think. Okay. Turn that. Let me know if it's too loud or too soft or whatever. All right. A 1939 biography of Albert Einstein offered a poignant example of the perspective that helped shape the famous scientist's relativistic view of Earth and space. Quote, the world is moving along rapidly in space. Your office in the morning will not be where it was when you left it at the close of business. It will never be in the same place in space again. Indeed, the sun plagues daily some 12 and a half million miles through the empty wastes of space, never to return to its former location. The Earth orbits the sun at roughly 67,100 miles per hour, even as the sun roars around the Milky Way galaxy at about 490,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, our galaxy is reeling toward the Virgo cluster, the largest and nearest cluster of galaxies, roughly 54 million light years distant at a speed of about 80, 864,000 miles per hour. But in relation to the background radiation of the universe, the Milky Way is racing through space at approximately 1.3 million miles per hour. As astronomers grapple to understand our place in the universe, every second our planet, sun, and solar system, as well as the Milky Way galaxy, whirl blindly into the depths of outer space. It's some consolation, however, that our neighboring stars and galaxies are barreling into the unknown abyss along with us. The sameness of the night sky has been recorded for millennia and is of great value to humankind. Long before written records, the positions of stars were used as directional aids in traversing the unmapped and largely unpopulated expanse of Earth's surface, its deserts and wastelands, and in navigating uncharted seas. The same stars trace the seasons of Earth's passage on its perdurable orbit around the sun. When humans as a species were first forming words, the rising, setting, and annual return of the stars and constellations in the night sky must have offered a sense of permanence in a savage world. Deeply embedded in our primal imagination were the stars as guides in navigating novel landscapes, locating seasonal fruits and vegetables, following migratory animals that provided food and pelts, and preparing for oncoming seasons. Much older than our sun, the Milky Way galaxy began to form approximately 13 billion years ago, and is a barrel, bared spiral com is a bared barred barred sorry not bared is a barred spiral uh, comprising some 200 to 400 billion stars. Its spiral arms, strewn with massive clouds of gas and dust, coalescing into newborn stars, sweep in magnificent arcs around the millions of stars. Com comprising the galaxy's central bulge. Because of the scale of this whirlpool of dust and planetary systems, from our perspective, neighboring stars appear to form a fixed pattern of constellations, and they only change their relative positions over millennia. Imagine if our planet circled a star that in turn was orbiting within a globular cluster, among millions of star cl stars clustered to form a soft-edged spherical structure. All the nearby star patterns would change over a lifetime, possibly never to reoccur. 
the night sky would be disorienting rather than a familiar point of reference. The seeming sameness of the night sky is a result of nearby stars hurtling along with our sun as it circumnavigates. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry. Um, hurtling along with our sun as it circumnavigates the Milky Way every 226 million years. Their high speeds and small relative motions reminiscent of racing cars on a circular track, but on a galactic scale. Of these stars, even the closest are so unimaginably far away, their actual motion through interstellar space is all but imperceptible. Hipparco's mission lead scientist, Michael Perryman, explains, quote, The bright stars forming Ursa Major, for example, one of the largest and most prominent of the northern constellations, known variously as the Big Dipper or the Plow, look, t- look the same now as they did hundreds of years ago. Ptolemy listed it, Shakespeare and Tennyson wrote about it, and Van Gogh painted it. And they will look just the same to our children, and to theirs. But to earliest humanity, a hundred thousand years ago, and to those equally far in the future, the constellation would be unrecognizable, grossly distorted from its present shape. End quote. In the prehistoric past, the stars were beyond human investigation, and perhaps even comprehension. Their extreme remoteness compared to our neighboring planets prevented us from initially realizing their true nature. Over time, we recognize that stars are fundamentally like our sun, replete with worlds we are now only surveying. We are only now surveying, sorry. As will become clear, the apparent sameness of the night sky over long periods of time has been an, has been an invaluable natural phenomenon for humankind coincident with our very survival. That's the end of that section. I'm going to grab some water. Hope everyone's doing well today. Hope everybody had a good weekend. If you uh, had a good holiday, if you celebrate. It was Easter for those who observe. <clears throat> All right. Ancient star catalogs and sky maps. From time immemorial, we have projected our stories, myths, and legends onto the night sky. Seeing patterns among the stars was a serious preoccupation from primordial time. Our shared narratives about the constellations across cultures and millennia served as a survival mechanism not to be underestimated or discounted as simple tales of mythological figures. Biocultural theorist Brian Boyd claims that human attention to pattern emerged as an evolutionary adaption. Boyd and other scholars contend that arts relying on patterns such as storytelling, song, and cave painting emerged via natural selection and allowed individuals and clans to better collaborate and share information and enhance survival. Recent analyses of prehistoric paintings and markings in caves in France have revealed a series of 26 symbols that may reflect humankind's earliest attempts at pictographic writing, traditionally thought to begin about 3000 BC. Anthropologists Genevieve von Petzinger and April Noel Collette Collette Colleted Sorry, I don't know why I had such a hard time with that word. Collated? They assembled a database of cave signs from 146 sites in France, dating from 35,000 to 10,000 years ago. Quote, what emerged was startling. 26 signs, all drawn in the same style, appearing, appeared again and again at numerous sites. End quote. The symbols range from straight lines to circles, spirals, ovals, dots, X's, wavy lines, and various hand symbols, among others. Similar symbols have been found at Paleolithic sites around the world. Certain symbols studied in France frequently appear in deliberate groupings, such as the occurrence of dots with a particular hand symbol, which may indicate the beginnings of a system. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so tired today. <laughs> um which may indicate the beginnings of a system of writing. As Noel speculates, quote, We are perhaps seeing the first glimpses, glimpses of a rudimentary language system. End quote. The celebrated Lacau, I think is how it's pronounced. It's a French word, so I'm not positive, but 
We'll go with Lacau. The celebrated Lacau cave paintings not only incorporate these symbols, but may also include representations of the Pleiades and Hyades star clusters and an Ice Age panorama of the night sky. Clive Rugels and Michael Cott, who in 2010 headed the International Astronomical Union's Working Group on Astronomy and World Heritage, reported to UNESCO that some archaeologists Archaeolo- arch- archaeostro- archaeoastronomers. There's so many vowels altogether. Archaeoastronomers, I think. Contend a series of dots above the aurochs in the Hall of the Bulls represents the Pleiades star cluster, and that one of the aurochs' eyes and adjacent dots may depict the star Aldebaran and the Hyades cluster. The French government's website on Lacau Cave Art. Lacau's cave art notes that all of the renderings, the horses, I'm sorry, I have no idea what I just read. Um, let me just start that sentence over. The French government's website on Lacau's cave art notes that all of the rent in all of the renderings, the horses were painted first, then the aurochs, and then the stags. These animals apparently correspond to the seasons of spring, summer, and autumn, respectively, providing, quote, a metaphoric ev- evocation that, in this setting, links biological and cosmic time. End quote. Even more fascinating is Chantal Jacques Wolkiewicz's Chantal Jacques Wolkiewicz's assertion that two panels of these cave images may depict the night sky as perceived by Magdalenian people from the top of Lacau Hill during a summer solstice roughly 17,000 years ago. Besides comparing the cave paintings to computer models of the night sky in the last ice age, she also found that light during the sunset at the summer solstice still enters the cave to illuminate some of the paintings. While it may be very difficult to determine whether the dots in the Lacau paintings are indeed asterisms, the markings ice age people, the markings ice age peoples at Lacau left next to their remarkable paintings, enticingly suggests that they were meaningful forms of communication. Extrapolating from such biocultural and archaeological research, it seems likely that our attention to patterns seen in constellations in the night sky extends back to our earliest days. The names of stars and designation of constellations as we know them in Western culture are so ancient that their origins remain elusive. Long before the earliest written records, Humankind told narratives about the stars and clustered them into constellations, which served as mnemonics for travel and navigation, and as a repository of knowledge about the seasons, but also of legends and myth. Only in the last 3,600 years do we find unequivocal evidence of tracking the stars. Chinese rulers employed court astronomers to record information regarding stellar motions, transients, and astronomical events such as supernovae. But even older than ancient Chinese records is the Nebra Sky Disk. Discovered near the town of Nebra in Germany, the Nebra Sky Disk is believed believed by archaeoastronomer is believed by archaeoastronomers to be a Bronze Age durable sky map dating back to 1600 BC. And I have a picture of that and I will pull it up and you can look at it while I keep reading about this. It's very cool. <clears throat> there we go. That's the Nebra Sky Disk, and I will continue to tell you about it. The disk was uncovered in 1999 by treasure hunters who hit upon an ancient burial site in a circular earthwork enclosure at the top of Metalberg Hill. The disk, 30 centimeters or 11.8 inches in diameter, Sorry, I just got startled by that noise. Thank you so much, uh, Amira Sophia for, uh, or Siofra, Amira so- Siofra for hosting us for, uh, I'm so sorry. I am stumbling over my words. She said, sorry. <laughs> Did you click something by accident? <laughs> no worries, no worries. But thank you for hosting us. Um, anyway. The disc was uncovered in 1999 by treasure hunters who hit upon an ancient burial site in a circular earthwork enclosure at the top of Metalberg Hill. 
Oh, you didn't want to interrupt. Oh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Thank you so much for hosting us. I appreciate it. Welcome to the stream. The disc, 30 centimeters or 11.8 inches in diameter, was found with two bronze swords, among other items. The sky disc is made of bronze with gold overlays of the sun, the moon in phase, and multiple stars. Gold bands on its sides indicate the east and west horizons and mark an angle of 82.5 degrees. At Nebra, sunset at the winter and summer solstices is visible on the horizon 82.5 degrees part. As the angular separation of those setting points varies at differing latitudes, some archaeoastronomers are convinced that the disk was constructed in the Nebra region and is the oldest extant sky map in the world. It's very cool. It's a very cool thing. So this is this helped map uh, this helped ancient peoples map the stars. <clears throat> A cluster of seven gold dots on the disk are thought to be the earliest known representation of the Pleiades star cluster, used in the ancient past for identifying seasons of planting and harvest. Investigation of its metal composition traces the disk to a Bronze Age mine in the Alps. The site where the disk was found is only 15 miles from Gosek, Germany, the location of a Neolithic ceremonial woodhenge dating to 7,000 years ago that researchers say clearly marks the position of sunrise on the horizon on, on the summer and winter solstices. Archaeologist Harold Meller, who posed as a buyer and worked with Swiss police in a sting operation to capture the underground traders attempting to sell the sky disk, points out that it predates, quote, the beginning of Greek astronomy by a thousand years, end quote. The ancient Greek writers Homer and Hesiod knew the names of recognizable stars and star clusters like the Pleiades and Hyades, and of constellations such as Ursa Major, the bear. The Iliad and the Odyssey, attributed to the poet known as Homer, remain the oldest extant Greek texts we have. Homer's tales were rooted in an oral tradition that extends back centuries prior to their being recorded. In the Iliad, traditionally dated to approximately 700 BC, some of the constellations we know today appear on the shield that Hephaestus forged for Achilles. It's just Hephaestus. Sorry, it looked like there were extra letters in there <laughs> from the way that I've seen Hephaestus spelled. It's just Hephaestus. Anyway, quote, He made the earth upon it, and the sky, and the sea's water, and the tireless sun, and the moon waxing into her fullness and on it all the constellations that festoon the heavens, the Pleiades and the Hyades, in the strength of Orion and the bear. End quote. James Evans also notes Homer's description of Odysseus orienting his ships by keeping the constellation Ursa Major, which turns about the celestial North Pole, left of his vessels as he sails east. One significant region, reason the early... Oh, one significant reason early agrarian societies marked the stars in the night sky was to develop an agricultural calendar, initially important for planting and harvesting. Evans points out that a few generations after, Homan, Ho, after Homer, Hesiod wrote, Works and Days, the opening lines of which directly associate the rising and setting of star groups with the agriculture. Quote, When the Pleiades, daughters of Atlas, are rising, begin their harvest, the plowing when they set." End quote. Evans explains that winter wheat was the only wheat planted in the Greek antiquity, so that when the Pleiades was setting in the west in late fall, it was time to plow the ground and plant the wheat. Nick Canis points out that ancient Greek astronomers supplemented their knowledge of the, sky, of the night sky with what they could glean from the Egyptians and the Babylonians. Quote, from the Egyptians, they learned about the length of the year, its breakup into a 12-month calendar, the division of day and night into 12 hours each. From the Mesopotamians, they learned a sophisticated system of constellations, especially involving the zodiac along the ecliptic. End quote. Babylonian temple scribes conducted serious astronomical observation and carefully preserved their records on cuneiform tablets. Many of these astronomical records have been recovered 
some of which date to the 7th century BC. A few of the most well-known of these tablets are titled Mul... It's M-U-L period A-P-I-N. So Mul Apin, meaning the plow star, the title of which apparently refers to the stars of the Triangulum constellation and the star Gamma Andromedae, not Ursa Major, also known as the plow, Big Dipper, or the bear. Evans observes that the Mulapin tablets, copies of much older texts, begin with a list of dozens of stars and provide a star calendar indicating the rising and setting of stars at particular times of the year. Also included in the tablets, which are more accurate than Hesiod's agricultural calendar, are observations of various constellations as well as the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter, the planet associated with the primary god of Babylon. Ancient Greek astronomers thought of the stars as fixed or immovable. However, the Greek astronomer Hipparchus, after whom ESA's Hipparchos mission is named, that's funny, the actual astronomer, this is a side, this is a sidebar, this is not in the book, um, but <laughs> the uh, actual astronomer's name was spelled uh, C-H-U-S for the Hipparchus part, and the ESA's mission is C-O-S. And I just think that's funny, because it is, like they say, after whom ESA's Hipparchos mission is named. But they didn't spell it right. Maybe that was just a choice. <laughs> anyway. Uh, he was an accurate observer who, quote, suspected that one of the stars may have moved and wished to bequeath to his successors data against which any future suspected movements might be tested, end quote. Hipparchus was interested in what today is called astrometry, 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 or the science of measuring the position and motions of stars and other astronomical objects. He produced a star catalog, now lost or destroyed. According to Floor Van Leeuwen, quote, the oldest catalog of stellar positions we know of is the compilation made around 129 BC by Hipparchus, a catalog that is still being investigated. Its only surviving copy appears to be a map of the sky on a late Roman statue and is known as the Farnese Atlas. End quote. For thousands of years, all we've known of Hipparchus' star guide were descriptions by Ptolemy. But astronomer Bradley Schaefer asserts that, indeed, the Farnese Atlas, a statue of the Greek figure Atlas kneeling while holding on his shoulders a globe of constellations, represents the stars and constellations known to the ancient Greeks. And I actually have a picture of that to show you guys. So this is the um, this is the statue that they're talking about um, with the constellations that they that they knew and that uh, some astronomers think is like the surviving record of what Hipparchus made. So he contends that the statue, quote, is the oldest surviving depiction of the set of the original Western constellations, and as such can be a valuable resource for studying their early development, end quote. Schaefer realized after a detailed study of the globe that the constellations depicted matched the night sky in the era, in the era and from the location where Hipparchus lived in 129 BC. As evidence in favor of this possibility, Schaefer writes, quote, First, the constellation symbols and relations are identical with those of Hipparchus and are greatly different from all other known ancient sources. Second, the date of the original observations is 125 plus or minus 55 BC, a range that includes the date of Hipparchus' star catalog, circa 129 BC, but excludes the dates of other known plausible sources, end quote. Schiffer concludes that, quote, the ultimate source of the position information of the constellations on the globe used by the original Greek sculptor was Hipparchus's data, end quote. So that's pretty cool. Because um, obviously a lot of uh, these records have been lost to time, but because an artist decided to include what they think is uh, an interpretation of the sky from Hipparchus, we have uh, a record of it, which is very interesting. A couple weeks back, somebody was talking about the intersections of um, 
arts and astronomy and in ancient astronomy um i think it's like super clear with stuff like this because uh not only is like art a way to preserve things like scientific knowledge but um to make it pretty and accessible as well all right let's keep on reading Hipparchus was the first to identify the Earth's precession, produced by, a gravity, by the gravity of the sun and moon on the Earth's equatorial bulge. The precession of the equinoxes refers to the gravitationally induced gradual shift in the Earth's axis of rotation, so that the equinoxes occur earlier each sidereal year over the course of 25,765 years, when the cycle of precession begins again. Precession is a changing view of the stars caused by a subtle variation in the Earth's orbit, orbital orientation relative to the Sun. It's not related to the kind of stellar movement that ESA's Hipparchos mission has charted. As Michael Perryman explains, the Hipparchos mission is based on the concept of parallax. Quote, the key to measuring stellar distances is actually based on the classical surveying technique of triangulation. It simply makes use of the fact known since the time of Copernicus, that the Earth moves around the Sun, taking one year to complete its orbit. This yearly motion provides slightly different views of space as we speed around the Sun. End quote. We experience the same effect in observing an object by, f by first closing one eye and then the other. Perryman points out that, quote, this stereo vision gives us depth perception and allows us to estimate distances, at least to nearby objects. Astronomers use the same stereo technique, but with views of the celestial sky separated by hundreds of millions of kilometers as the Earth moves around the Sun. In this way, nature has generously and serendipitously granted us the possibility of measuring distances stretching across the vast expanse of our galaxy. That's the end of that section. It gives the Iliad quite a different hue. You always assumed it as tragedies. Yeah, I actually, I haven't read the Iliad. I um I read a lot of um Greek mythology stuff, but I never really read like the Iliad or like any Homer things, the Odyssey, stuff like that. Um but I should. I think it's on my bookshelf actually. Um but yeah. I'm glad you're enjoying story time. <laughs> Amira All right, let's keep going. Okay, Astronomy's Human Genome Project. Michael Perryman has dubbed the Hipparchos mission astronomy's equivalent of the Human Genome Project. Perryman explains that as astronomers more accurately map the location, velocity, and vector of stars in our galaxy, we can understand the age and morphology of the Milky Way, how our galaxy has evolved in the past, and what the future holds for our solar system and the galaxy. For instance, the Hipparchos mission has contributed to our better understanding of the galaxy's current structure. We know our galaxy is not a perfect spiral, but is instead a barred spiral that's warped so that the limbs at one end curve up and at the order and at the other bend down. And I actually have an image of that as well. Is that the right image? I guess so. Yes, it is. So um, this is a um, this is an image. <laughs> I was gonna try to say graph, but it's it's not a graph. Um, it's just an image um, of the Milky Way. So you can see here uh, that there is a what they call a subtle warp in the disk. Um, which is exaggerated, exaggerated in this schematic view. Um, so it's it's like it's it might be kind of hard to see over stream, but if this is the center of the galaxy, this side is bending down. Um, it's like curving down, while this side is curving up. So you get like a whoop. Um, they describe it in the book as a. Uh, 
like a wide brim tat where one brim is up and the other is down. Uh, and that's how our, our galaxy is shaped, which makes it a barred spiral instead of a regular spiral galaxy. So yeah, cool stuff. And I will continue. Another major contribution of Hipparchos for astronomers and popular audiences is that the mission improved the estimates of distances to stars harboring exoplanets. In this way, it has crystallized our sense of the growing number of distant worlds in space. We've seen in the earlier chapters on the solar system that planets and moons are potential abodes for life. As the human genome is a project to map the underlying structure of terrestrial life, so Hipparchos is a tool to help astronomers map plausible sites for extraterrestrial life. The search for life beyond the Earth is a foundational scientific pursuit, and it has attracted attention from some, from some unlikely quarters. The Vatican has maintained an observatory over the centuries in order to officially determine dates of the calendar year. The Gregorian calendar has been used in the Western world since 1582. However, astronomers of the Vatican Observatory, more recently, have been focusing on other concerns. In November 2009, sorry, I have to move my mic for a second. In November 2009, Pope Benedict the, oh, oh. I'm very bad at Roman numerals. So we're just going to say Pope Benedict, the one that was alive in November 2009. Because I don't know which one that was. <laughs> Called leading astronomers, astrobiologists, and cosmologists to Vatican City to spend a week presenting recent findings regarding exoplanets orbiting nearby stars and to discuss the possibilities of intelligent life in those, sol in those star systems. Of the Vatican's interest in exobiology, science reporter Mark Kaufman noted, quote, Just as the Copernican Revolution forced us to understand that Earth is not the center of the universe, the logic of astrobiologists points in a similarly unsettling direction to the likelihood that we are not alone, and perhaps that we are not even the most advanced creatures in the universe. This may conflict with the stories we tell about who and what we are. End quote. During the five-day meeting, scientists address subjects such as the origins of life, extremophiles and their habitats, the likelihood of such life thriving on moons in the outer solar system, and whether life's biosignatures could be detected... Oh, sorry and whether life's biosignatures could be detected on exoplanets. As yet, exoplanets are mostly gas giants, with little chance of life on them. But as the detection limit has reached Earth mass with NASA's Kepler satellite, research spurs scientists, philosophers, and theologians alike to contemplate the implications for our place in the universe. Quote, The questions of life's origins and of whether life exists elsewhere in the universe deserve serious consideration, explained Jose Gabriel Funes, a Jesuit priest who is also the director of the Vatican Observatory. Co-author Chris Impey, <laughs> who presented a paper at the meeting and co-edited the written proceedings, comments, quote, both science and religion posit life as a spectral outcome of a vast and mostly inhospitable universe. There is a rich middle ground for dialogue between the practitioners of astrobiology and those who seek, seek to understand the meaning of our existence in a biological universe. End quote. Reporter David Ariel, who also covered the meeting, aptly noted, quote, The Church of Rome's views have shifted radically since Italian philosopher Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake as a heretic in 1600 for speculating, among other ideas, that other worlds could be inhabited. End quote. For the moment, most of the vast inventory of stars remains out of reach, but several hundred relatively nearby stars are known to have planets, and Hipparchos has been an essential tool in measuring their distances. These new and potentially habitable worlds range from a dozen to a few hundred light, few hundred light years away. Spanning the entire galaxy, one estimate is of 8 billion terrestrial habitable worlds around sun-like stars, each of which has the potential to be to host life. This number is the same order of magnitude from the m number of base pairs derived from the Human Genome Project, making literal the analogy of a vast mapping project to parse life in the Milky Way. 
And that's the end of that section. You said it's very sus that they burnt him. It is. It's very sus. Uh, people who have been anti uh, science ha- have f- for a long time been very sus, I would say. <laughs> it's really funny. All right. Oh, thank you. I got my stickers on it. Actually, I have one that's kind of a space sticker. It's like a redraw um, of Leo, but with like a reference to a TV show that I watch. I love stickers too. They're fun. My corgi butt. I love corgis. A place that I used to go in Tucson. If you live anywhere near Tucson, Arizona, go to Scented Leaf Tea House. If you don't, Look them up online. Order some tea from them. Excellent. It's good stuff. Nice little small business to support. Corkies do have the cutest butts. I want a corgi so bad. One day. <laughs> All right. So, unsung heroes of astronomy. To judge the scientific contributions of Hipparchus, we start by recognizing that measuring the positions of stars is both fundamental and unglamorous. It's fundamental because it's key to measuring the physical properties of celestial objects. Positions are the keys to to, to the oh, positions are the keys to the trigonometric determination of distance, and distance is needed to calculate the size, mass, and intrinsic brightness of any planet, star, or galaxy. Without distances, we're stuck with the appearance of stars in the sky and a star that's far away and luminous can appear to be the same brightness as a star that's nearby and dim. That ambiguity is fatal to any reliable understanding of the denizens of the night sky. It's unglamorous because measuring a position is the simplest and most obvious way to characterize a star. There's no image, just two angles to identify a unique spot on the sky, with no units. Needless to say, people who do such prosaic work don't always get their due. It was not always that way. On the spinning earth, the measurement of star positions is critical for keeping time and navigating. Early cultures noticed and tracked star positions as if their lives depended on it, which they did. In the 3rd century BC, Timocharis and Aristilus produced the first star catalog in the Western world while working for the great library at El... (laughs) while working for the Great Library at Alexandria. About a century later, Hipparchus extended their work, generating a catalog with 850 star positions. He also divided the stars into intervals of logarithmic brightness that formed the basis for a system that astronomers still use. This was a natural way to classify brightness since the eye has a nonlinear or logarithmic response to light. Ptolemy increased the catalog to 1,022 stars. These star catalogs are among the most impressive intellectual achievements of antiquity. Later generations of admiring astronomers called Ptolemy's stellar compendium Almagest, which means greatest in Arabic. As in many other aspects of astronomy, the torch for mapping stars was then taken up by the Arabs for a millennium. Around AD 1960... Nope. Around A.D. 964, the Persian Abd al-Rahman al-Sufi wrote his Book of Fixed Stars, which depicted the constellations in glorious natural color. Al-Sufi was the first to catalog the large Magellanic Cloud and the Andromeda Nebula, two distant star systems whose true nature would not be fully understood until the 1930s. The pinnacle of pre-telescopic observations was reached by Tycho Brahe in the 16th century. Through relentless attention to detail and the control of systematic errors, he improved on the positional errors of earlier catalogs by a factor of 50. His reputation didn't suffer from doing these mundane measurements. Brahe was celebrated in his lifetime and is considered the greatest observer before Galileo. The big prize in astronomy was its use to measure the distance to a star. Astrometry, I'm sorry. They look so similar. 
Stars are so far away that the apparent seasonal shift of a nearby star with respect to more distant stars, the effect called parallax, was not observable for the first two centuries of use of the telescope. Friedrich Bessel won the race to detect parallax by showing that 61 Cygni, one of the closest stars, was nearly 10 light years away, or staggering 60 trillion miles. Bessel didn't have a university education, but his meticulous calculations elevated him to fame as one of the most noted scientists and mathematicians of the 19th century. The parallax shift is extremely subtle and far more difficult to detect than the large-scale migration of constellations through the night sky as the Earth spins on its axis and orbits the Sun. Almost all stars have parallax shifts over the course of a year of about one second of arc or less, and most stars visible to the naked eye have parallax shifts smaller than 0.1 second of arc. For comparison, each of the letters on an eye chart that defines 2020 vision spans an angle of five minutes of arc, a 3,000 times larger angle. Thereafter, actually, no, I was like, I stopped for a reason. I stopped because I wanted to show you an image. Um, so this is a, uh, this is like a, a drawing kind of illustrating um, parallax uh, and how it's used to figure out how far away stars are. So, um, and I think this this is something that uh, Professor Impey actually just put together. So you have uh, the star that you're trying to find, right? And uh, over here is the sun and the different positions Earth can reach in June and December, or if it's, you know, it could be at any point, uh, depending on where the star is. But for this one, they did the, the uh, solstices. I was trying, I was going to say equinox, and I'm like, that's not right. Um, so you measure the distance from one side and the other side. You do some complicated math, and then you can figure out how far away it is. And a simpler way to, um, to like, illustrate that, if you're trying to figure it out, I'm going to use this. If you take, like, an object and you hold it in front of yourself and you close one eye, right? Like, you, like, like line it up with something as you close one eye, then you know, switch eyes, and they'll have moved, right? It won't be lined up with whatever you lined it up with. Um, and that's how we determine the distance, um, is the, the triangles. So, yeah. Cool stuff. You want to learn Arabic? That sounds really cool. I want to learn any other language other than English, honestly, because that's all I can speak. <laughs> oh, you're Canadian. That's cool. Nice. We have so many international people here. Um, all right. I will continue. Thereafter, astronomy lapsed into the status of a worthy but dull aspect of astronomy. In part, this was because it was so challenging to measure parallax. In the half century after Bessel's measurement, new star distances were only added at the rate of about one per year. Through the 20th century, photographic plates made it easier to capture and measure star positions. And Herschel's project to map the Milky Way galaxy was carried out by researchers in Europe and the United States. But the air blurs out the light of all stars to about one arc second in diameter, one thirty-six hundredth of a degree, larger than the size of the angle that has to be measured to detect parallax. Refraction and telescope flexure also complicate a parallax measurement. Astronomers were bumping up against the limitations of, this of the atmosphere, and the only solution was to go into the pristine environment of space. Hipparco scans the skies. By the 1980s, astronomers had convinced their funding agencies that a space observatory to measure star positions in the vacuum of space would be a good investment. The High Precision Parallax Collection Satellite, Hipparchos. Okay, is that why it's... I guess, I guess the acronym is why it can't be named correctly. But, like, Hubble is not an acronym, right? Is Hubble an acronym? I'm not sure. 
but apparently this high precision parallax collection satellite spells Hipparchos, kind of, but not the right way, <laughs> which is funny. But it went through a series of design studies with the European Space Agency and was launched in 1989 on an... The leaf blowers have returned. Apologies. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> um, it was launched in 1989 on an Ariane 4 rocket from French Guiana. Hipparchos is the only facility in this book not supported or operated by NASA, but its importance transcends its county, country of origin, and U.S. astronomers have used it extensively for their research. National boundaries melt away in the night sky, and international collaboration is the lingua franca of astronomy. Indeed, the stars belong to no one, and yet to everyone. The telescope that transformed the precision with which astronomers can map the sky was only 29 centimeters in diameter, not much larger than a dinner plate. Many amateur astronomers use bigger glass for their mirrors of their handmade telescopes. Its mission lasted for just three and a half years, from August 1989 to March 1993, yet the data are still generating scientific results and publications 20 years later. Hipparchos was one of the last space missions before the advent oh, sorry. Hipparchos was one of the last space missions before the advent of CCD detectors. The satellite swept its gaze across two widely separated patches of sky, and the starlight fell on a set of alternating transparent and opaque bands, and then onto an old-fashioned photomultiplier tube. The primary goal of the mission was to measure the positions of 100,000 stars with an accuracy of 0.002 arc seconds. How small is this angle? 500 times smaller than the typical angle by which a star image is blurred out by the Earth's atmosphere, or equal to the angle made by lines to the two opposite sides of a penny in New York as seen from the apex of a triangle in Paris. Imagine a great city ringed by a fence. It's nighttime, and you're outside the tall fence looking in. As you walk around the fence, the lights of the city will appear to flicker on and off as they pass behind the slats of the fence, and then reappear in the gaps. Now imagine a somewhat different situation. You're inside the city, and wearing a hood. The hole for each eye is covered with extremely thin vertical slats, like a miniature fence. As you turn, the lights from the streets and buildings brighten and fade as they pass in between and behind the slats. Hipparchos worked in this way, scanning a great circle on the sky every two hours, with its two imaging fields, or eyes, seeing a particular star 20 minutes apart. The precision of the measurement came about because the angle between adjacent slats was only one arc second, and then combining a hundred or more observations of the same star give a much smaller angular error. In addition to using data to measure positions, astronomers use the repeated observations to search for variability in the light of hundreds of thousands of stars as Hipparchos pivoted to scan the entire sky. That's the end of that section. The concrete landscapers have returned, yes. I'm glad it wasn't picking up. They're always here. Ooh. I'm so sorry I'm yawning so much. I'm very tired. Cool Hubble. Too late in finding the community. <laughs> Hubble's great. Love Hubble. All right. Hipparchos by the numbers. For a direct sense of what Hipparchos learned, ESA offers a sky map on its website that can easily fit in the palm of your hand. The Hipparchos star globe represents the brightest stars and the major constellations measured by the satellite as charts that can be printed out on two sheets of paper and then assembled into a sky sphere. In fact, for ease of construction, the sky is projected onto an iconos icosahedron, a polyhedron with 20 triangle-shaped faces. Instructions for constructing this astronomical origami are also provided on the ESA website. This simple sky chart conveys no more than the bony skeleton of the night sky's stars. Hipparchos mapped the astronomy 
or the anatomy in exquisite detail. Its main instrument charted the positions of 118,218 stars with its highest precision. In addition, a beam splitter was used with a secondary detector to map out the sky with slightly lower precision. The resulting Tycho catalog lists 1,058,332 stars. Years after the satellite ceased operation, astronomers produced the definitive Tycho 2 catalog, containing a prodigious 2,539,913 stars. That number is 99% of the stars down to the 11th magnitude, which is a level 100,000 times fainter than the brightest star, Sirius. With this exquisite level of detail, Hipparchos has mapped our location in the city of stars called the Milky Way Galaxy. Space missions produce data of such complexity and abundance that it's often years before all the results are known. Hipparchos is no exception. The Tycho 2 catalog was published in 2000, seven years after the satellite returned its last data. As recently as 2007, Dutch astronomer Floor van Leeuwen reanalyzed the Hipparchos data. He diagnosed many small effects that had been overlooked in the original analysis such as tiny jogs in the spacecraft's orientation due to micrometeorite impacts and subtle changes in the image geometry each time the satellite went into Earth's shadow and then emerged into sunlight. He also took advantage of great gains in the power of computers to improve the calculation of positions. With a million stars, the number of angles between any star and all of the others is a million squared, or a trillion. To pin down the errors in positions, those trillion angles must be calculated many times, a procedure that took six months at the end of the mission, but only a week when Van Leeuwen did his work doing much, using much faster processors. His analysis had shrunk the errors by a factor of three from the initial goal of 0.002 arc seconds, and a factor of 10 for the brightest stars. This minuscule angle would be formed by drawing lines from the top and bottom of Lincoln's eye on a penny in New York and having them come to an apex in Paris. The trick of Hipparchos is to measure positions across the entire sky rather than picking off stars one by one. Thus, it gains from the power of large numbers. Imagine you had to cover the floor of a large room with irregular but similar sized tiles. You could lay them out tile by tile with a good chance of keeping the separation of adjacent tiles uniform but as you covered a larger region, it would become very difficult to control the uniformity. Whether you worked from the center out, or from the edges in, or from side to side, it's likely, it's likely you'd either have tiles left over or leave a gap. The optimum solution would be to be aware of the distance between any two tiles and regulate it over the whole area, thereby filling it uniformly. If the tiles are now stars in the sky, that's what scientists did with the Hipparchos data they made an optimal solution for all stars simultaneously. In practice, it was a calculation that taxed the best computers at that time. Behind the numbers are the people who work to make a mission successful, often devoting their entire scientific careers to the task. Michael Perryman was born in the dreamy industrial town of Lutton. Dreary, not dreamy. Dreary. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> Just north of London, and he was interested in math and numbers from an early age. His math teacher at school advised him to study a subject with better employment potential. He ignored the advice and studied theoretical physics at Cambridge University. For his PhD, he stayed at Cambridge, but switched to radio astronomy, joining a group that was still buzzing with excitement from the discovery of pulsars and the award of the Nobel Prize in Physics to Martin Ryle and Tony Kiewisch in 1974. At this point, he has spent 30 years of his career on the unglamorous but very important work of mapping star positions, exceeding the amount of time the illustrious Tycho Brahe spent on his observations. Appropriately, in 2011, he was awarded the prestigious Tycho Brahe Prize by the European Astronomical Society. Perryman was just 26 when he was selected to be the project scientist for the Hipparchos mission a great honor and responsibility for someone so young. Soon, he found himself responsible for the coordination of 200 scientists and for all the headaches that go along with such a complex multinational project. 
The biggest challenge came soon after launch, when a motor on the Ariane rocket malfunctioned, and the satellite didn't reach its desired geostationary orbit. The unplanned orbit exposed Hipparchos to high levels of radiation twice a day, and it was thought the satellite might not last for more than a few months. The team adjusted and made the best of the situation. But for over two years, Perryman lived under a sword of Damocles, as gyros were knocked out by the radiation. In the end, the mission exceeded its design goal of both lifetime and science. Away from the project, Perryman enjoyed hiking and caving, choosing to escape underground from his upward-looking day job. That's the end of that section. How much more we got? Let's see, let's see. It's about... It's about 11. We're about halfway through. All right. Great. One, two, three. We got like seven pages left or so. Not bad. Not doing bad. All right. Anybody go caving? Sounds like a wild thing. This Perryman guy enjoyed hiking and caving. And I've been hiking before. I can't say I've been caving. Well, okay, that's a lie. I went to a very popular cave once, but it was really just a hike because it was so popular. Did anybody go hiking or caving? Other outdoor activities? You do. <laughs> that's so cool. Caving is the best. That's awesome. That's really cool. Do you just like find caves and just like go in them? Or are they usually like like trails that are like marked like this is cave is safe. <laughs> you won't you won't fall in a hole here. <laughs> Cause that would be the scary thing for me. Like what what happens if we just don't come out? <laughs> you haven't been for a long time. It sounds really cool. In Mexico, you have a lot of beautiful caves. Oh, wow, that's really cool. Huh, that's really awesome. You do both. You do the uh, the marked ones and the unmarked. That's cool. That's really cool. That's brave. That scares me. I do some hiking. My partner really likes to hike, so I'll, I'll go with him sometimes. Um, but yeah, I went once. There's like a cave in, I think it's near Flagstaff. Um, that was like an old uh, volcano tube or something. Um, and and it's like turned into a hiking path, which is pretty cool. China has natural caves with underground water and ice. That sounds really cool. Big caves are cool. Small caves, no thanks. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm like very like claustrophobic. So that's also probably part of it. Why I'm not super into it. <laughs> but that sounds really cool. All right. Stepping out into the universe. It sounds implausible that a small telescope with a single mode of observing could touch every area of astrophysics, from planets to cosmology, but that's the legacy of Hipparchos. By measuring the positions of more than 100,000 stars 200 times more accurately than ever before, Hipparchos redefined and recalibrated the basic ingredients of stars, and that's fundamental because stellar properties lie at the base of a pyramid of methods used to establish the distance to nearby galaxies and on into the universe. Without a tether in nearby stars, the entire edifice of the cosmological interpretation of redshift, where the shift of galaxy radiation to longer wavelengths is used to ascribe a distance according to cosmic expansion, would be suspect. The lava tube caves, yes, thank you. That's the one that's in, uh, um, uh, in Flagstaff, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's really cool. Thank you for that. All right. Anyway, <laughs> in the solar system, distances to the planets are known with very high precision. We can bounce radar off Mercury, Venus, and Mars, and measure the time of its round-trip journey to, de to derive distance. Kepler's laws provide the relationship between orbit period and distance that lets us calculate the distance to the outer planets. Beyond the solar system, even the nearest star is trillions of miles away. The most direct method of measuring distances uses slightly different perspectives on a nearby star between when the Earth is six months apart in its orbit of the Sun. 
As we've seen, this is stellar parallax. A skinny triangle in space is created when the base equal to the Earth's orbital diameter and the long sides hundreds of thousands of times longer. Distances measured by trigonometry involved no assumptions, except that three-dimensional space is flat and Euclidean, so they form the secure base for all other distance determinations in the universe. As astronomers step out through the universe, no single method of measuring distance works on all scales. So they have to step out with a series of overlapping indicators, each of which has a range of applicability. Like a series of ladders climbing high into the sky, where a wobbly lower ladder causes the whole edifice to sway, a tighter local distance scale Sorry. A tighter local distance scale ensures more accurate distances to galaxies. Before Hipparchos, astronomers had measured the distances to several dozen stars with just 1% precision. Hipparchos increased that haul by more than an order of magnitude to more than 400 stars. At the precision level of 5%, Hipparchos increased the number of stars with reliable triangulated distance from 100 to over 7,000. Good distance determinations are now widely available out to nearly 500 light years from the sun. That's a small patch of the Milky Way, which is 100,000 light years across, but it's a patch large enough to include all stellar types and almost all known exoplanets. The precision of the distances map distances maps into a similar precision. Oh, sorry. The precision of the distances maps into a similar precision for the derived parameters such as size, luminosity, and mass. Hipparchos measured the distance of the bright star Polaris as 432 light years and tightened the error from 30 to 7 light years. Polaris is important for the distance scale because it's the closest and brightest Cepheid variable star, whose properties define a distant indicator that can be used from our neighborhood in the Milky Way out to galaxies tens of millions of light years away. Unfortunately, Polaris turns out to be an anomalous and a recent study turns out to be anomalous. And a recent study revised the Hipparchos distance down by a third to 323 light years. Another bright star, Deneb, had an estimated distance of 3200 light years. It was almost completely indeterminate. Its distance firmed up to 1,400 light years, with an error of 230 light years. Hipparchos also measured distances to a few open clusters, open star clusters, like the Pleiades and the Hyades, which allows bridges to be built to more remote regions of space. First, the trend line of main sequence stars, a relationship between luminosity and temperature when the energy source is hydrogen fusion, can be fit for all stars within the cluster. The offset between the main sequence best fits for two clusters gives the, relatives di gives the relative distance because the brightness of the stars goes down with the square of the increasing distance. Second, a cluster will contain rare variable stars like Cepheids and RR Lyris that can be seen to very large distances. Polaris is a nearby Cepheid variable. Cepheids have a useful linear relationship between their luminosity and the period of their variability. So knowing the period and the relative brightness of two Cepheids gives the, gives the relative distance between them. Nearby variable stars with parallax measurements can be used to reach out to analogous variables in galaxies as far away as the Virgo cluster, 54 million light years away. Once in the realm of galaxies, Global properties of galaxies such as their rotation rates and sizes are used to calculate relative distances. By now, the latter is getting rickety, and errors are 10% or more. Thereafter, the expansion of the universe imprints a redshift on all galaxies, and distances can be derived in the context of the Big Bang model, which relates distance to recession velocity for all galaxies. Exploding stars called supernovae are also used to estimate distances in the remote universe billions of light years away from Earth. But all these methods are rooted in the work of the modest Hipparchos telescope. Okay. Hipparchos touches all of astronomy. I'm gonna move that a little. Okay. Astrometry may be the Cinderella of modern astronomy, 
but astronomers in all fields are continually reminded that everything starts with mapping brightness and position. Hipparchos leveraged historical measurements by providing the most accurate reference frame. With the invention of the photographic plate in the mid-19th century, comparing photographs of star positions from different eras could in principle reveal star, star motions. But it's usually unclear which sets of plates has the largest errors. With Hipparchos as the rock-steady gold standard, astronomers gleaned new insights from century-old data. The hundred or more observations that the satellite made of each star allowed it to detect variability. Over 12,000 variable stars were found in the database, about 10% of all the stars studied, two-thirds of which were previously unknown. The observation of the variables was coordinated with a network of amateur astronomers, who filled in with the data when a star was temporarily out of the satellite's viewing zone. Hipparchos was also able to resolve or distinguish over 24,000 double and multiple star systems. Binary stars were actually a headache for the science team, because they mimicked problems in the photo, uh, photometry, and a faint companion could throw off the position of the brightest star in a pair if the two images were not well separated. A sampling of projects will give a sense of the dizzying range of investigations enabled by the Hipparchos data. Galactic archaeology is a good example. Hipparchos data showed that some of the stars in the neighborhood of the Sun are part of a disk that's 10 times thicker than the disk where most of the Milky Way star formation takes place. Differences in the heavy element abundance in the two components are consistent with a model where the Milky Way assembled was assembled from similar galaxies. Sorry. Hipparchos data showed that some of the stars in the neighborhood of the sun are part of a disk that's 10 times thicker than the place than the disk where most of the Milky Way's star formation takes place. Differences in the heavy element abundance in the two components are consistent with a model where the Milky Way was assembled from smaller galaxies over billions of years. 10% of the stars from the spherical halo, as well as some of the thick disk seem to come from a single invader ga galaxy that was disrupted soon after the Milky Way formed. Also, the fine view of stellar motions provided by Hipparchos allows astronomers to turn back the clock and trace the sun's passage around the galaxy and in and out of the galactic disk over the past 500 million years. During that time, the sun has passed through spiral arms four times, each corresponding to an extended cold spell in the climate history of the Earth. It is speculated that exposure to the high cosmic ray flux in the spiral arms leads to more cloud cover and longer ice ages. Hipparchos data were used to show that the dim companions in some stellar systems are brown dwarfs. These elusive objects are gas balls less than 8% of the mass of the sun, too cool to shine by nuclear fusion. They emit a feeble infrared glow and slowly contract as they leak their energy into space. In 1991, a star being observed by Hipparchos dimmed slightly on five occasions due to the shadow of a giant planet passing in front of it. This was four years before Ma Mayor and Quellos stunned the world with their discovery of the first planet beyond the solar system. But nobody was looking for such signals in the Hipparchos data, so the eclipses remained undetected until 1999. Since then, additional exoplanets have been dug out of the database. Hipparchos also produced a beautiful confirmation of general relativity. Einstein's theory states that mass bends light, and it was first confirmed in 1919 by observations of the deflection of starlight as it grazed the limb of the sun while observed during an eclipse. General relativistic bending is 1.7 arc seconds at the limb of the sun, and it declines with the projected distance from the sun's gravity, but is still detectable 0.004 arc seconds at right angles to the sight line towards the sun. This subtle measurement shows that the paradigm of curved space applies everywhere. The curvature is so slight that it doesn't negate the use of Euclidean triangles to measure distances. To test general relativity, while firming up measurements of the size and expansion rate of the universe, is quite an achievement for a small and often overlooked space mission. And that's the end of that section. 
gonna take a drink of water and uh, I think we have about two pages left and one more picture sorry if it feels like I'm rushing a little bit this week um it's because I am I <laughs> Uh, I have somewhere to be at noon and uh, cannot be late and uh, <clears throat> I have to leave by like 11.30 which is in oh, 18 minutes <laughs> so uh, we're gonna read this and I'll give you a little wrap up and um, I'm gonna I'm a peace out but we will be here on Wednesday oh and uh, we won't be here on Friday actually um, I'll explain more, but uh, amateur astronomy uh, has to be postponed this week, uh, unfortunately. But we will be here on Wednesday, so. All right. Passing the baton to Gaia. In a sense, not much has changed since ancient humans first looked toward the skies. Astronomers today are equally compelled to interpret the patterns in the stars within our galaxy and beyond. In late 2013, ESA launched its next astro astrometry mission, with the Gaia spacecraft, the Global Astrometric Interferometer for Astrophysics, which will expand the work of Hipparchos. The Gaia mission, however, will be far more extensive and accurate in its survey of stars, taking in data on a thousand million stars in the Milky Way, charting the position, distance, brightness, and movement of each one. And there is a figure of this right here. So it says, uh, the protean work of measuring the distances of stars facilitates a wide range of astronomy projects. Where Hipparchos reached several million stars, ESA's Gaia mission will reach and measure nearly a billion, enabling everything from the local test of general relativity to a better understanding of the archaeology of the Milky Way. And I'll leave that picture up for a second so you guys can, um, can check it out while I continue. It will achieve this by using much larger mirrors than Hipparchos and much more sensitive CCD detectors. Its goal is a precision of 20 micro arc seconds for stars at magnitude 15, or 10,000 times fainter than the eye can see, and 200 micro arc seconds for stars at magnitude 20, or a million times fainter than the eye can see. To extend an earlier analogy, the smaller of these tiny angles would be formed by drawing lines from the top and bottom of Lincoln's eye on a penny in New York, and having them come to an apex not in Paris, but on the surface of the moon. It's a very precise telescope. <laughs> it is anticipated that Gaia will measure and characterize several thousand exoplanets, detecting them by the subtle motion they induce in their parent star. Among these distant worlds, some that are Earth-like must surely exist. However, Gaia's primary mission will be to produce an extraordinarily precise three-dimensional map of the Milky Way galaxy and sharpen the crispness of our 3D view. As explained on the Gaia website, quote, In the process, Gaia will also map the motions of stars, which encode their origin and subsequent evolution. Through comprehensive photometric classification, Gaia will provide the detailed physical properties of each of the billion stars observed. End quote. Such information will include data on luminosity, temperature, gravity, and elemental composition, which can be used to unravel information on the origin, structure, and evolution of our galaxy. Quote, Gaia's expected scientific harvest is of almost unconceivable extent and implication. Amongst other results relevant to fundamental physics, Gaia will follow the bending of starlight by the sun over the entire celestial sphere and therefore directly observe the structure of space-time." As a means of comparison with its predecessor, Gaia planners note, quote, "...the 16 volume of Hipparchos would instead be 160,000 volumes, and instead of filling one normal bookshelf, that bookshelf would have to stretch the equivalent distance of Paris to Amsterdam." End quote. Perhaps most important, Gaia will dramatically alter our sense of humankind's place in the Milky Way and in the universe, far exceeding the Apollo 8 image of Earthrise from the moon, or the Apollo 17 image of the whole Earth. The Gaia mission has the potential to entirely overhaul our thinking about, the gra about our grain of sand, the Earth, and the chasm of interstellar space. 
Astronomers have already discussed the extent to which the mission will powerfully impact non-specialist audiences. In the coming decade, our children will have the opportunity to see in exquisite detail where we are in relation to our nearest star neighbors, as educators plan virtual astronomy courses for educational institutions and planetaria. Based on new and rich data from Gaia, virtual flights in a, into a 3D version of a larger portion of the Milky Way galaxy are just one of the expected educational outcomes. With Gaia and the virtual galaxy, its data will help build. The scientific and public understanding regarding our place in the Milky Way is poised to be radically reconfigured. Roughly half of the world's population live in urban areas. Light pollution inherent to cities means that 50% of humankind has to a large extent lost access to, and knowledge built upon, the night sky. However, scientific missions like Hipparchos and Gaia are restoring our relationship to the stars and generating remarkable new knowledge regarding Earth's place in our galaxy. Hipparchos has already rewritten the narratives we will tell our children about the past and present morphology of the Milky Way and the exoplanets we are currently finding orbiting nearby stars. What Gaia promises to contribute will rewrite the textbooks again. The story of our galaxy that we hand on to future generations will disclose the number and locations of many other worlds like ours, and will inevitably be vital to the human narrative of future ages. And that's the end of that chapter. A lovely little ending there. I like that. All right. Well, like I said, I am very limited on time. But thank you all so much for joining me for chapter uh, seven, technically eight. I don't know. A chapter um, in this lovely book. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new. I sure did. Um, and like I said before, uh, this coming week it will be a little different because Friday uh, we have to postpone. Well, we have to cancel Friday. Um because of some issues with uh, travel and stuff. I'm not... I have to go somewhere, essentially. I will not be in the house, and therefore I cannot stream. So um, we're going to uh, cancel our amateur astronomy this week, but it is um, International Observe the Sky Week, I'm pretty sure. Um, so if you, uh, if you have a telescope... Or if you don't, or if you have some binoculars, go outside, look at the sky. So it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be great. Um, and then Wednesday we have um, our regular uh, astronomy news chats. And Professor Impey streams this week, I believe, on Thursday. But I uh, am not positive on that. But that will be on the schedule soon, I promise. Um, so I have got a get going but thank you guys all so much for being here um remember to follow if you haven't yet uh so you know when we go live and uh subscribe if you can that really helps out the channel and uh i will see you next time so thank you all for hanging out bye